Uh, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, yeah, so uh, this is something that kind of really became the importance of, of how these these items function uh, in my time as, as an asset manager. Uh, so I, when I worked at the utility, I spent a lot of time uh, doing transformers. Uh, we did all our commissioning, all our own testing, uh, replacements and everything. And, and starting looking, started looking into why, why things fail. And, and I think when you start looking at transformer failures, you, of course, everybody's aware you have a breaker that doesn't open. And we, we had a couple of those where there weren't breaker fail schemes in place. And, a, you know, a six minute through fault goes through a piece of equipment and it, it burns the station down. Uh, but it's these um, it's these these slow operating breakers that 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 get overlooked a lot through testing. Uh, anybody that's ever done any amount of breaker testing, you would know that uh once you operate a circuit breaker, the timing of that breaker has improved greatly. And, and for for a, a long period of time, all the testing we did at breakers were, was done after the breaker had been taken offline. So we're talking timing and travel type testing, uh, this sort of thing, which requires an, an opening of the breaker, uh, drops to be removed, grounding put in place. Then you do your testing. Well, after you for operated that breaker that first time, uh, you, you would find that that second operation can be very deceiving as to what that breaker is uh, going to actually do, uh, perform like in, the, in, in a real world circumstance. Uh, so I've seen, so we began first trip testing at this point, which was something I've, I've, uh, I, I brought to the utility a couple of years before I left. And we were finding a lot of breakers that we were getting good tests on, uh, they may be opening at 400 milliseconds on the, on the first operation and the next one showing 40. Uh, so you're, you're, you're not aware you have this bad equipment in the field. Uh, and so over time as faults are going through this breaker and it's, it could be taking up to three times as long, four times the, the nameplate rating to actually open. And it's still well under any relaying protection. So over trips or, 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 fail schemes that are in place you're still operating before those happen uh but you're placing three to four times the duration of through fault on the transformer for each incident um because nobody really pulls the os oscillography of a breaker trip unless it's, there's a breaker fail and, and and that in most instances in most utilities i've talked to well th this this increased duration that you're allowing with all these faults that come through transformers seeing all of those and you'll find that over time uh you're just really sucking the life out of, out of your transformers uh and and it's it's not necessarily something you would see with routine testing you know your five-year let's pull a dga let's run a power factor it, it it doesn't really become apparent uh until it's gotten to the point that it, it's irreversible um so just kind of talking about breaker maintenance, uh, I, and I feel like this is something that, that utilities really need to take a hard look at because a lot of attention gets put towards putting monitoring on transformer. We do bushings. We do pa partial discharge, uh, multi-gas DGAs. I mean, we're spending hundreds of thousands of dollars on, on these, this transformer monitoring, yet if you have breakers operating slowly, either from the, the, the load side, the distribution side, uh, you know, where you have a lot of faults occurring, uh, you're really, you're, you're, you're bypassing that, that secure feeling you've gotten from this monitoring because you, you really are affecting the life of that equipment. Um, so one of the big problems I've already talked about a little bit with breaker monitors is, is they're mechanical, uh, it's much more so than a transformer. And because of that, practices the maintenance practices are incredibly important and not just how often are you testing these but how often are you operating them um is and what type of tests are we running uh and this time between maintenance cycles so if you get to a, to a transmission type breaker we're looking at those every five years distribution maybe not even that often i've talked to several companies that don't don't look at them at all uh, of course, like I said, once that fault's passed through, it's upstream through the transformer, and now you have 
placed all this this mechanical and thermal stress on this equipment for extended periods of time. Uh, so these long periods that occur between these main maintenance cycles really allow a lot of bad things to happen with with our circuit breakers. Uh, the biggest enemy of this breaker is to sit there in a static state year in and year out and not be operated and then to be called on to suddenly interrupt something in three cycles. Um, so another thing you really have to do to, to get the benefit of, of the offline maintenance or your online monitoring is, is, is understanding these, the different types of mechanisms and how they perform. Um, you know, when you start looking at a spring mechanism, knowing when does that motor start, what would be a odd occurrence in, in motor current being drawn for that run. Uh, then you get into hydraulics or a pneumatic and, you know, those motors run differently. They run at times when that breaker's not operating. Uh, so understanding kind of how that, that mechanism is working, you know, it's, it's, it's the latch being struck, is the latch being actuated. Things like this, they really make a difference in trying to interpret the data you're getting from your test or your monitoring. So a basic knowledge of, of the equipment is, is absolutely necessary. So just quickly to run through kind of a, what I did when I was at the utility and, and, and what most utilities seem to be doing, uh, almost everybody's doing some type of visual inspection. And, and this happens on a, at an annual basis, generally, uh, not necessarily a, an equipment expert performing this, maybe some type of operator that's going through, but they'll, take, they'll go through, we'll open the cabinet up and take a look at things. And, and you know, we're looking for anything that's, that's out of the ordinary, uh, corrosion starting to, to develop somewhere uh, in the control circuit or on the mech somewhere, um, discoloration of terminal connections, you know, where we're seeing these, these connections getting bad or loose, and we're starting to see some discoloration from that, from the heat generated from those connections. Uh, is there a lot of moisture getting in the cabinet? Um, rust, uh, corrosion, that type of thing. And, and this could be associated with either heater failures, uh, which would be a lot of the time, or it could also be bad seals, um, conditions of the bushings. Uh, and it's, I was just got back from TechCon and there was talks of, you know, people shooting bushings. And, and that was something we dealt with. Uh, we had kids that picked rocks up outside the station one time and had taken a bunch of skirts off. So you're, you're, you're looking at that kind of thing. You're looking at gas pressure. So it's SF6. We want to see, you know, are we, are we in the green for this breaker? Uh, operations count uh, and then oil and hydraulic levels. Okay, so as I said, when I first took over in the asset management role, um, we were exclusively doing timing and travel tests for our circuit breakers, uh, and, and and it is a great test and it's a necessary test. However, when you're only running that test, you do lose a lot of information as to how your breakers are performing in real time due to that operation that you have to perform before you can set up the test set. Uh, however, I do think there are times when this test is absolutely critical that, that it be run, uh, and that would be uh, on commissioning of any new breaker. Uh, we're going to get some information here that we would not be able to get from other testing. Uh, such as, uh, you know, the, the total travel distance of the breaker, the, the actual speed the breaker is operating at. So this provides us a baseline of mechanically, how is this equipment, equipment performing? Uh, we're going to get a closed time. We're going to get an open line, we're, open time. Uh, we'll get that, the difference between the poles can be, be collected at this point. Contact velocity, uh, over travel. So th these are things that, that, Really, you, you can't measure online as well, uh, but if you have this initial test, uh, you'll see how that goes once you understand where everything's moving and you go into the other testing, which would be our first trip type testing. Um, we can now overlay test and compare signatures 
And if this test is still looking good, we're probably still good on all our timing and travel characteristics at that point. So the first trip test was was something I incorporated. Um, and this is performed, we would go in, we would bypass the breaker that was being tested either through a reserve, a reserve bus or some bypass switches. And you want to run this test before that breaker is operated and at a time when that breaker has not recently operated. Because like I said, you, you'll see due to the nature of the grease in the breaker, uh, as it sits for these long periods of time, uh, tends to separate out. You have a thickener and a lubrication component. Uh, after a long period of time, those tend to separate. That first trip can be 10 times longer than the rating for the breaker. Uh, but with also with that actuation, you now remix these components and your next test would be fine. Uh, now, the problem with that is once you start having lubrication get in that state, um, if you walk away from that breaker and think, oh, okay, everything's good, and I've, I've done it, I've been guilty of it myself, where you go out and you test something that doesn't test bad, well, let's operate a few times. You get a good time. However, that good time, it, it, it erodes rather quickly as you leave. Uh, we, we tried several different lubrication procedures, uh, just trying to figure out simpler ways to, to get these things up to speed, and you'd find that once something's starting to get slow, uh, that, that problem becomes exponential over time. Uh, so something that slowed a few milliseconds, this operation, that could be 40 or 50 milliseconds two months down the road if you don't address the underlying cause of the problem. So first trip allows us to capture a signature of what that breaker mechanically looks like with the operation. Uh, it provides open and close interrupt times. Uh, we're gonna capture coil current with this. Uh, ox contact position, pole discrepancies. Uh, and the the thing I really liked about this test is we look through this graph, it, it provides us a very detailed analysis of mechanically how are the different parts of this breaker performing. So we can see that the instant that plunger starts to move or, or coil, not movement of the plunger, but the energization of that coil. And we'll see that that plunger is pulled through and we can see at point C, it struck a latch. And then we push through the latch at D and we're to E and the plunger is extended and hit a buffer. Uh, we see that the, the max current for that coil is drawn and ramps up. And then we see at point G, we see that's where our auxiliary contact has de-energize that circuit and we are now set up for our close or should be set up for our close operation. So, so it gives us a really good idea of mechanically, has anything changed? Because when you do this, you can actually overlay these different waveforms and, I, and you can say, okay, the latch was a little slower getting off this time, or we drew a little more current. So, so it gives it, it allows us to do a pretty detailed analysis of what's happening mechanically. Um, some other tests we run, uh, contact resistance or the ductor test. So you're, you're measuring the current carrying part of the contact um, in micro ohms. So this is a great test for, you know, when the breaker's in a closed state, uh, what's that resistance look like to the contacts? However, not to be confused with being any type of indicator for contact wear. So erosion of those, that, that, that arcing contact, absolutely nothing you can tell from this test really as to, to what that looks like. Um, SF6 moisture purity, uh, we would go out, we would run these tests. Uh, which, you know, you start seeing a lot of moisture. We've got redu re reduced dielectric strength of the SS6 gas. And it's also going to affect how quickly that, that SF6 gas can recover. Uh, so with each operation, of course, the, those, those molecules are, are broken down during arcing. But the great thing about SF6, it tends to reform into SF6 unless we start introducing a lot of moisture and a lot of oxygen. Now we start getting a lot of byproducts and that that rate of decrease of dielectric strength is affected by this. Um, DRM, 
I found was a great. So this is a dynamic resistance test. And especially when you start getting into SF6 breakers where you really don't want to go in that tank if you don't have to. Uh, a lot of times internal inspections often make more problems than they solve with these breakers. Uh, this test allows us to actually see the exact instant that those arcing contacts make and we can slow close until we see where did we reach our actual main contact. And so it allows us to have a judge of how much contact where we're experiencing uh, in this breaker without actually having to go in and open tanks up and you know drain gas and then introduce moisture into that system. Uh, power factor was something we would do. And again, these are like every five years we're running these tests. Uh, however, I, with SS6 breakers, I, I really didn't find a lot of use for this test. Uh, it really only gave me a good idea of what the weather was like when the test was run. I mean, it, it's uh, truly not a capacitive type device that we're measuring. And uh, there's a few schools of thought on that, but that was just always my opinion that was like, well, it's just telling me how much humidity and what the temperature was like outside. I would see breakers test great at one part of the year and look like they were failing another with this particular test. Um, so uh, the big thing about testing is you just can't do it often enough. And, and now's probably a good time to jump in. I should have said this on our visual inspection. I think probably one of the, the more important things you can do with circuit breakers is a maintenance trip of that breaker. So if you can't get out and test it every year, every two years, at least get it operating. Again, that's where we're really going to run into our problems. It's just letting them sit in the static state for a long time. Um, however, a lot of times, even with the best testing and maintenance cycles we have, we have a lot of small problems that can occur between testing intervals that end up being big problems that if they had been detected sooner, uh, really wouldn't have been that much of an issue. Uh, so a big one of these is lubrication, degradation of lubrication. And depending on the type of testing you're doing, uh, this one gets missed a lot. Uh, now, as we moved into newer breaker designs, of course, this is less of a problem, but still slowed operating times are something you're going to see occur with time, and especially with this, this lack of operation. Um, heater failure, and, and this is one I, I really talk about because it, it seems like it's not that big a deal to a lot of, a lot of people I talk to, <laughs> but I can promise you that a heater failure will lead you into a breaker not operating if left unaddressed. Uh, we had a lot of OCB type breakers still on our system and it, it would be a few times a year, you would go out and something didn't trip, you go out and check, heaters weren't working, a lot of condensate in the cabinet, uh, cartridge fuses that the cardboard portion of them have become so saturated, just fell out. Uh, a lot of corrosion to the control wiring, things like that, breaks out of terminal blocks. So heaters are a big deal. Uh, and this is one of those things that are, it's, you know, it's easy to check that static heater, not, not as easy to check thermostatics and tank heaters, uh, tends to get missed. And these are important items to make sure that those breakers are operating as they should. Uh, leaks in hydraulic and pneumatic mechanisms. Uh, this can result in a failure to operate. And again, it could happen at any point. If you're only getting out there once every five years or so, you could have a terrible, a terrible leak and, and have no, no pressure there at all. Um, many times, I, I don't ever remember walking in and we did have a lot of pneumatics on our system. Still, I, I hardly ever remember walking in a substation when I didn't hear at least one compressor kick on somewhere in that substation. Uh, so these are things that happen that, you know, if you catch that early, uh, you fix the leak. If not, you burn a motor up or you end up with a breaker fail. Uh, losses SF6 gas is another one. Um, again, mechanical grade gauges are great for this, but and visual inspections. But over time, you got to remember that if a breaker is running a nominal 80, let's say 87 PSI, uh, we're not getting that first 
alarm point until around 78 PSI. So a leak could be present for quite some time before it's ever detected. Uh, then, of course, failure of trip and closed coils and, and sticking in eroded ox contacts. And this is one that you don't necessarily see um, as the main problem, but the problem that it leads to with coil failures uh, can often be attributed to these type of type of events. Um, so this was just kind of our monitoring and, and the things I, I considered very important to look at when you're looking at a breaker, uh, you really need to have those temperatures to understand if heaters are working as they should. This would include a, a ambient temperature, a cabinet temperature, uh, gas temperature, these types of things. Uh, then, of course, your control circuits uh, and implementing a, some type of waveform capture. Uh, again, maintenance trips are great, but without the without having some type of test set present to capture that at, in a high speed rate, uh, standing next to a breaker 30 set 30 milliseconds doesn't sound any different than 150 milliseconds it's just hard to hear it uh motors are they starting when they should are they drawing consistent current um heaters are they working as they should and then of course you've got to have all these operational things you know is our ac voltage levels good or is our dc voltage level good um you know what's our operations count uh trip coil integrity that sort of thing so just kind of, and, and so our monitoring was was based largely on that first trip methodology uh, with a high speed capture, um, allowing us to capture this unique fingerprint for every breaker uh, as it operates in real time. So just to kind of talk through this just a bit uh, of what we're looking at here, uh, so relay or you you send a trip signal to a breaker uh, as we see this current start to ramp up. That would be that trip coil being energized uh, and the plunger will be pulled through this. Uh, when we see we reach this peak at B, we see that the the plungers actually reach max, maximum velocity at that point. So we'll start to see a, a slight decrease in current until point C, at which point that plunger is going to strike that latch. Uh, now, this is sometimes apparent, sometimes not, depends on design of the breaker. Uh, I know with a lot of vacuum breakers, you won't necessarily see this point, uh, but we will always see this E point. So this is our buffer. That's when that plunger has traveled through that coil as far as it can go, and that's going to cause that coil to saturate out that point, and we're going to go to max current that that coil will, will hold uh, at F here. And then until we see the the 52 contact associated with that come open. Uh, so that's going to allow us to now de-energize. So just a quick uh, mechanical association of this graph with what mechanically is happening. Um, so we're also going to look and we're going to see uh, our main contact here. So this would be current flow through the main contact so that's breaker. And we will see when did that get extinguished in relation to when did this operation occur? So we need all of these values to really make a very good assessment of is this breaker working like it did? And, and the great thing is that the ability to overlay these. So it becomes little small changes, you know, a couple of milliseconds here or there. We see it in this very, very early stages. Uh, generally, with breakers, after testing them, a lot of them for a lot of years, you know, generally two or three milliseconds is pretty normal uh, or less than. Uh, when you start seeing slowdown rates more than that, you're you're starting you're you're starting to have a problem. Uh, and, and again, this is not an outage problem at this point, but it's something if left unaddressed will end up not only causing outage time, but also really robbing your transformers of their life as well. So this is just more, and actually I've kind of talked through all this, I do apologize, but uh, we do have, if you go to our website, uh, YouTube Dynamic Ratings, we do have several videos that really detail this probably better than my description just did. Um, but, you know, you can see the actual moving parts and how they occur. Um, so we're going to just kind of blow through this real quick because we kind of talked about it. So this baseline I'm talking about, and, and we kind of walked through that, 
this is a, a very important thing. Um, if you're putting monitoring on your breaker, uh, if you're do for any kind of testing, uh, and, and not necessarily holds true with, with only breakers. I had a talk about, uh, partial discharge with, with a customer the other day. And they're like, well, what kind of, what kind of guidelines, you know, what, what's, what's the spec on that? What's too much. Um, so I, I found in my time as asset management, it really was effective to look at each piece of equipment individually. Uh, and when I say that, I mean it, that you're always comparing a piece of equipment to itself. Um, so with transformers, of course, we have guidelines of, of 100 ppm for hydrogen. Uh, so we set an alarm. We go from condition one to condition two. However, what if that transformer has been running at five parts per million for 20 years? Well, 100 is concerning at that point. Uh, and that's why I'm kind of with this. You always want to say what's normal for this piece of equipment uh, as you understand it. And that could be, you know, sister units from the same manufacturer uh, is offers some insight into this, but it's really best if you can take that piece of equipment and compare it in its state today to its state 10 years ago or 10 years from now. Um, so that's why we we have emphasized when we put monitoring on any type of breaker in the field, uh, we do establish a baseline uh, and all alarming concerning that equipment is is based on what that baseline looks like so if you were to take a three cycle breaker roughly 51 millisecond operation uh you operate most of those they're going to operate in high 20 to low 30 milliseconds that would be normal uh for that breaker which means I would probably set an alarm point about a half a cycle longer than that. So let's just say we came in at 30. I would probably set that first interrupting time alarm point at 38 milliseconds. We are still well under the 51, the nameplates rating the breaker for. But what this allows us to do is just to see that, to see that initial slowdown of that breaker before we get into other problems on the system uh you know you, you take a distribution breaker uh doesn't trip now we now we've tripped a bank breaker from the over trip and now we have four circuits out instead of one uh and and and, and much like transformers with breakers usually these these failures don't they don't happen suddenly it's not a oh well it it, it just failed for no reason uh and and this is really where we take advantage of our online monitoring is by setting this kind of thought process around it it's understanding what's normal for that equipment and then compare every measurement we take of that equipment after that to that initial measurement and looking for these changes and you will find and like i said it's a lot of time in transformers uh i did a lot of work with carbon oxide ratios and the trending of those things over time failure is generally something you see coming well before it actually happens and with breakers it's the same way and I, i've got some pretty good examples here of the types of defects we're going to look at and how we would spot them when compared to that baseline so this first one uh is is a capture monitoring and this would be a signature that i would expect to see um if I was looking at probably probably a loop most most oftentimes a lubrication type issue uh so that blue line being our baseline operation, uh, the red line being some another operation that occurred at some point after that. So there's a few things we're looking at here to determine uh, that that's what we're dealing with. And, and it, it allows us to do a lot of analysis before we actually roll a truck on site to, 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 to do any type of work uh, and generally ends up in a much better much quicker solution to the problem once they get there and fewer truck rolls happening. Um, so when we look at this, one of the big things we need to note is that the actual current through that breaker was interrupted at a later point than it was during this first operation. Uh, we're going to look at our trip coil. We're looking at this, this 52A roll off. Where did it happen? Uh, which was also well after the, the initial operation. And then when we look at our auxiliary contacts, we had the same thing. Uh, now, a little bit in this graph, I probably 
would think that we would have a little less time in 52A and 52B in this type of instance, depending on what type of slowdown we're seeing. But when I see these three items combined, it gives me a good idea that the overall function of that breaker was slower from the initial trip. And I'll go back and look at this buffer point and this last point, and I see that they are overlaying perfectly. So now this gives me an idea that, okay, plunger hit the latch about the same time. Latch came off at exactly the same time as it did the last operation. So at some point after that, so now we're into our the main stored energy uh, of that breaker that was slowed down. Uh, we're slower getting off of A and on to B. Um, so most most of the time, this would be a lubrication type of issue. And again, it, it's it's not necessarily this obvious with the first one you'll see. Generally, I, I, from the ones I've seen come from the field, and, and it's really been enlightening getting to work for a monitoring company now because you see that that first slowdown might be three milliseconds. Uh, we had one installed at a renewable company, uh, switching from solar to generation, and this thing's operating two or three times a day. So you would expect the breaker to, you know, you wouldn't have a lubrication issue. You would think operating that up frequently, uh, but we would we saw the first slowdown. Uh, it was three milliseconds. I think the, the next one was maybe two weeks later. It had exceeded out to about 10 milliseconds. We're starting to get starting to get alarms in at this point, um, but it didn't get addressed and was allowed to, to progress and in a period of about four months, the breaker had slowed down 150 or milliseconds or so, enough that it caused a breaker fail scheme to amp operate and took the entire system off the line. Um, so, again, these these are the advantage of having the monitoring is that we can set these things um, tighter our alarm points tighter, um, not so much so that we get false alarming, but enough so that we start seeing these incremental changes and we're able to address these issues before it does result in some type of, of major outage. Um, so stepping on, to, I think I may have. So we talked about first, First trip testing, and and like I said, I, I was a big fan of that utility. Still, I am, and and this was what I was talking about at the beginning of this 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 uh, webinar. Uh, this was a first trip. It's a vacuum pipe breaker, so again, you don't really see that latch time as well. Uh, kind of a dirty signal, but enough that we can tell what's going on. We can see we're at around 120 milliseconds on this first operation of this breaker. So this is our our coil being de-energized. This is our contacts down down here, main contact current flow through them, and we can see that we're out well outside of that th that three cycle spec. I believe this may have been a five cycle. Um, so then we close the breaker, we operate again, we overlay those waveforms, we see we're back in under our 50 milliseconds. So now we're back within nameplate. So this is a good example of that always taking things, only doing the offline testing where you're taking something completely out of service uh, can really mislead you into thinking your equipment's performing much better than it actually is. So sticking auxiliary contacts, um, this is something I, I saw quite a bit of at the utility, and and this this will cause a breaker failure if, over time. Uh, coils and breakers are not made to be continuously energized, um, and the only mechanism for de-energizing those coils are those aux contacts that are in series in that circuit. Uh, so we see here that, yes, the on the second operation, we interrupted current flow almost exactly at the same time we did on that first operation. We start looking at our auxiliary contact. At that point, it rolls off in that waveform, and we see that that, that coil stayed energized about four times as long as, as it did on the initial trip. Uh, now, the problem is, eventually, this, this problem tends to get worse over time, and eventually, you will cause a coil failure. You will burn the coils out of this. Uh, and the reason I say we had at the utility, and this again came from when I was working at the utility, same kind of signature we're seeing here. Uh, 
current interrupted through main contacts back here. We see that, however, that, that coil state energized for almost, for a little over 800 milliseconds on a 30 millisecond operation. Uh, and this was a breaker that we had to replace a lot of coils on. We had several breaker fails come from this one because trip coils would be burned up. Uh, so a lot of times when you start seeing that in the field, it can be traced back to this kind of thing. Uh, so this is another, just another example of, of something within the, the actual electrical component of that circuit that it gives us an early tip off that, hey, we're, we're about to have, you're, you're going to have a failure if this doesn't get addressed. And not necessarily this type of problem you would never see from your, from your relaying because, again, the breaker trip when it was supposed to. So nobody really looks at it that closely at that point. So now we get in and we have another slow operation, but in this instance, we can track back to a latch type issue. Um, so the, the things we're gonna look for on this uh, is how much current are we drawing before that latch actually gets hit? Uh, and you see we do have a considerable amount more drawn here. And that latch will be, that latch point and buffer point at, are, further, are further along in the time scale than what we would see on that initial trip. Uh, and my apologies, I would expect a slower interrupting time to accompany this as well, as well as increased uh, change of state of auxiliary contacts. Um, so when you start seeing this, you're starting to have some type of plunger latching issue that you need to go into probably some adjustments that need to be made uh, but again if not addressed this breaker is not going to activate for you one time when you're calling on it so uh, this is another example of that latching issue and this is one i actually was had talked about a little bit from the renewable. Um, so it was a vacuum type breaker. Due to the design of that breaker, you didn't necessarily see the instant the latch was struck. We could see buffer times, but we wouldn't see latch times. Um, but what we did notice, and, and this was really a, an interesting find as it relates to vacuum breakers, we were seeing, let's go to the actual graph. So we would see this was our, this was that first slowdown I was talking about. Now, extremely slow breaker so there were some interesting things that how we detect our open times and arcing times uh we're looking at this introduction you'll start to see some harmonics introduced into the signal uh that become pretty apparent during the arcing portion of that operation so in this case we had a very slow breaker to start with uh somewhere under 100 milliseconds uh switch gear type backing breaker and we do see that we have a pretty large reduction in current when we start to see those contacts part. And we also see this harmonics that are introduced. So we're not near as clean as we are back here in the, in the signal. Um, and we can see that, yes, we have hit the buffer at the same point, and, but we're way slower coming off of the latch times. So knowing the design of the breaker and knowing that okay well we we can't see the latch in the initial we can't at this point write it off to either a bearing or a latch issue uh, without some more analysis so this was left to slow down and like i said there's about four four months that happened between these these graphs it had slowed down that much in that amount of time uh, but we kind of still see the same thing happening here um we see that we reduction current, we see induced harmonics, and but we also start to see a ramping up of our current uh, as this, this arc is extinguishing. So now you're thinking, well, is it backing bottle issue maybe that we have where things aren't going getting out right? Uh, obviously, we have something slow, but the thing that really tipped it off is that when this 52A does roll off at the end of this operation, which means that the cam of that mechanism has now been able to get off the A and get onto the B, we see that these, these currents are immediately extinguished after that occurs. So kind of takes away from it being a dielectric type problem and really kind of brought me back to, it looks like a latching issue. I mean, with, with the context of the vacuum 
striker being a butted contacts. Uh, just kind of looking at this, you can kind of picture that we we've moved through that mechanism that actuates the latch, uh, which has allowed some separation of main contacts or at least relief of pressure of main contacts. Um, but it hasn't released that stored energy system to the point that it can completely clear uh, this arc. And thus our prolonged protracted type arc that we're seeing here, where we're starting to really ramp up to the point that we're almost about to run away before this breaker is able to get extinguished. So that was kind of the diagnosis we drew from this, uh, sent it back to our customers. I don't think I included it. I did not include it in this presentation. Sent it back to the, the, the customer and had them test it luckily they did send me a video of it and it was absolutely that's that's what was going on we were seeing uh plunger operating perfectly it was pushing through a, a lever that actuated a latching mechanism however this latching mechanism would stall out before it completely completely released that main cam so we would see a slight movement of the main cam when the latch mechanism first started to actuate and then everything kind of stalled at which point it would finally drop. And when it did, the main cam came up and fine. Uh, it still ended up being a lubrication, but it was a lubrication with the latch mechanism and not a lubrication of the, the, main, the main cam. Uh, so again, with, with this type of detail and understanding what type of breaker am I looking at and what's happening between the current through the main contacts and the signature of the coil, the, the coil we can make a pretty detailed analysis of what's going on with that breaker when it does slow down, when we get these alarms. And when you're able to make a, a fairly accurate diagnosis from the data that you're receiving, uh, again, it really, repairs seem to work at that point. Generally, if you just send a crew out and say, hey, we've got something slow, go check it. That's two or three operations from getting a good time but it's a deceptive good time because it's not going to, it, it will not last. After a few months, we're going to be right back in the same boat, if not worse, uh, with these slow operations. So another thing we can see in the electrical or the control circuit portion of that breaker is any type of bad wiring that may be present. So when we start talking about pitted, bad auxiliary contacts, loose connections within our control wiring. This shows up pretty quickly on, on these, uh, these, these grabs from the monitoring or a first trip type test as well. So we see here that the, th the thing we're really looking for is through this max current portion of the waveform, uh, you won't see this, this nice max current and this smooth drop off once that 52A opens. Generally, during this portion of the waveform, we're going to see sort of an erratic signal. Uh, so it, it, it kind of slopes away a little worse, uh, can be to the point that it even affects the operation of the breaker, but I would expect this to be a little erratic. So to show a test, this was from a first trip test set, and this is kind of kind of what I was talking about, how it would look. So once we hit this max current due to to that bad connection, bad wiring, uh, we see that it's kind of in and out. So it's, it's, it's just not jumping that gap as smoothly as we would with, a, with a, good, a good connection. And then when it does finally slope away, we see that it slopes away kind of in a not, a, it wasn't like the current was cut off in a smooth manner like we would expect to see with, with a healthy control circuit. Another thing that, that has really, I've enjoyed about the working for a company that does online monitoring where I'm really getting to look at a lot of data is understanding graphs concerning some of the other stuff, such as SF6 gas. Um, you know, that was something at the utility, you get alarms, you roll crews out uh, because you don't know. You don't know until you, until you get somebody out there, look at it, how bad of a leak have I got? Is this just a temperature related dot drop? Uh, so with these, you know, occasionally walking by the breaker if you've got a breaker that's filled just above where it needs to be when it's warm you're getting alarms on the winter so with online monitoring 
we're able to bring in temperatures, constant ambient temperatures, constant gas temperatures, uh, constant pressure values. And we get a graph like this, which really lets us take away quite a bit about a quite a bit of information about how this breaker, um, you know, is it leaking? How 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 secure are those tanks on the breaker? So if we look, we can see that we have a lot of the orange being our temperature variation, and we see we're up and down pretty good with that. And we see that even with the temperature compensated gauges or or transmitter, uh, you're still going to see four or five pounds on a normal day of pressure swing. Uh, but then if we look where we're getting to these negative 10 days and things, we do see seven, eight pounds a drop in our pressure. Um, so that lets us understand what this breaker looks like at this temperature. What should the pressure be? You know, when it's 60 degrees outside, what's this breaker normally? What's the pressure look like on it? Uh, and again, we're comparing this equipment to itself. Um, so another thing we're able to take away, we see that we have applied a line here that's letting us know this is our alarm point. Also, it's a point that we would expect tank heaters to be cutting on. Uh, and looking through the graph, we don't see that. Uh, now, monitoring also did provide an alarm that said, hey, tank heaters aren't working. Um, they go out and look, and sure enough, the RTDs for this breaker, they were never pulled out of the control cabinet. So it's sitting in there with the heater. So it, it doesn't know it's negative 10 outside. Um, so they make this repair, and now we see every time we drop under this negative 10, we're seeing pressure go up nine pounds. Uh, so that's those tank heaters cutting on and off, uh, which is another great reason to be monitoring heaters. Uh, we don't need tank, tank heaters that cut on, thermostats that stick, and we end up with tank heaters running the summer because now we're putting overpressurizing tanks, which, again, is just leading to more leaks. So by the, the ability to enter... The ability to trend this information 24 hours a day over years really lets us have a much better understanding about what's actually happening with our equipment. Uh, and in my discussion with customers the other day about PD, that was that's kind of a recommendation recommendation we make we install pd and of course the big thing with pd is well how do i filter noise and, and of course there's there's a lot of methods for filtering it but you really have to take that pd signal and see what's what's normal for this piece of equipment you know i, I think the question was asked well what if somebody opens the switch well you know when, when you're doing the nice thing about doing online monitoring constantly is that you're not looking for the, the one-off type thing, uh, a weird thing. We're looking for a trend. So those, you know, we're not looking for that one pulse that happened two months ago. Uh, we're looking at what are those pulse counts? What's the magnitude of those pulses? Um, where are they at in the phase resolved data? And understanding what this equipment looks like all the time. And it allows us to establish a trend. And now with that trend, we can understand any type of change that happens because a particular customer I put it on, they had put, they had put PD on a switch gear. Um, a favorite was just a lot noisier, nothing wrong with the gear. That's just the way it was, the way it worked. And, and you'll find that when you start looking at, at equipment like that, that you really do have to understand if you walk through with a handheld, um, just occasionally, you may think you have a problem there when really you don't. So online monitoring does allow us to look at these things from a from a much higher view to see how that how that equipment's performing on a normal basis. Uh, another great thing that we like to trend is motor data. And I've learned more about breaker motors since I've been here than I did in all my years of utility and understanding how the different mechs how the motors run with different type of mechanisms. Uh, so we can tend it can trend things like motor starts. And we can say we have one motor start on this date, one motor start this date. And we can separate these motor starts into two different groups. And the first one being a non-operational start. So that's the motors running when the breaker's not operating. And then operational starts, which would be a start associated with an operational breaker. And especially when you get into pneumatic and hydraulic mechanism, understanding these non-op starts is critical to understanding the integrity of that stored energy system. Um, 
So this would be how we do leak detection. And, and honestly, you know, without having somebody stand there, you have no idea. I've seen, I've seen some hydraulic breakers, they start once a week. I've seen some that start once every two months. Uh, so we're able to go in and establish an alarm on what's an allowable number of starts for a 24 hour period. Uh, and generally you could say two, just to be safe on that. Um, so as you see this trend, we're getting one, we're getting one. This was some operations that's occurred. Uh, we get one, we get one. We had some more operations. And by the, separating these out into, and not done on this graph, but now we separate these out and we understand that, okay, this thing's been starting once a week for the last five years. All of a sudden, we're seeing three starts a day. Well, you develop, developed a leak that point. And again, not something you would necessarily, you may catch it on a, visual as you're walking through, uh, but it could be two years before anybody takes a look at that. And now you've had a motor burn up or you've had a breaker fail occur that was something as simple as a little plumbing fix that you could have taken care of. So I just, I think that the, the ability to look at this data and trend it over time like this and always be comparing that equipment back to itself just gives you a lot of value, valuable information. It's going to really help you better coordinate your maintenance around that breaker uh, and it's going to prevent a lot of outage time and that's all i got for you today so i'm going to turn it back to randy uh, anybody wants to reach out to me if you have any questions i'll answer those as best i can thanks for having me randy i appreciate it thanks very much chris for the great presentation we have a few questions oh okay okay here you go do you monitor the interfaces of protection relays between the transformer breakers and the relays cycle of operation? That that is something we do not do. Um, and, and and kind of the reason behind that is most utilities and really us as well. You, you, there there's kind of a wall between those things. Um, if, if I'm understanding your, if your question correctly, and if I'm not, please tell me. But, you know, uh, there's kind of an unwritten rule that monitoring and relaying should never touch. And really, that's uh, I have a webinar coming up on, on protective relays versus online monitoring. Uh, you know, two different things there. Um, so we we don't monitor as to when that relay through that signal. Now, we can tell you things like. When the when the signal comes to the breaker, we can tell you was it trip coil one or trip coil two that fired to cause this this actuation. Uh, we can record, you know, did this breaker reclose? We can see that type of thing and provide alarms concerning that. But as far as taking information directly from the relay as to you know a, a timestamp from the relay as to when it actually sent the signal compared to when the breaker operated, no, that we we really don't. Our monitoring doesn't touch relaying uh, in, in any way, shape, or form. Okay, I hope that answers your question. Uh, next question: Have you simulated the trip coil current wave form in PSCAD, or I think it's ETAP? How does it compare with actual measurement? I, I, Randy, I I haven't had to do this yet, but I don't know what that is. <laughs> okay. Right. I apologize. I'm not going to make okay. something up. If they want to elaborate and send me something, okay. I'll be happy to do okay. it. Okay. Good idea. Trip coil burning or re relay contact damage. What will come first? Uh, it kind of depends on what the problem is. You know, um, like I said, if if you had that, if you had that auxiliary issues with auxiliary contacts, um. You're, you're probably going to see coil failure before you see a, a, a relay problem out of that. And, and again, it depends on, you know, how sophisticated is, is your relaying scheme at that, at, at that point too. I mean, if you're as someone that came from a utility, I had everything from, you know, the, the DFRs, the latest and greatest to uh, a lot of old electromechanicals, you know, uh, you couldn't tell if they're reclosing if you didn't go in there and, just spend a little disc by hand, uh, something like that. So it depends on that level. But I would say a lot of times that's one of those things, especially as you get into distribution where a lot of people haven't upgraded their relaying, uh, 
you're going to find that it auxiliary contact stick tend to be quite a problem. Uh, I, I installed one in one of these in Malaysia uh, a couple years ago, and that, that was something we found there. It, it was a pretty modern GIS, uh, but we were finding the close coil. The close coil was intermittently, you know, the first operation of this breaker had been sitting a while. Uh, it stayed up. It stayed that that close call stayed energized about four to five times as long as it did on the next operation. And again, a problem like that tends to to escalate over time. So I would say you would probably start seeing a, a burnt coil, a coil failure type issue, before you relay and picked up. But again, it, it kind of depends on how your relays are set. Okay, good answer. Is there any dependence of closing time on SF6 pressure? Is there not that I'm aware of, Randy? Now, I, again, I'm, I'm I don't know everything, but I haven't seen. I mean, we, when we start talking SF6 pressure, um, we're looking at extinguishing uh, is what we're looking at, and dielectric strength, which is is obviously related. As far as the close operation of the breaker, uh, I'm not aware of anything of how that would affect your closing time whatsoever. Uh, now, maybe a pre-arc or something like that, but I, I wouldn't think it would be a the overall closing time, the actual mechanical closing time. I can't see how that would be affected. Okay, great answer. Okay, that's it for the questions. Thanks very much, Chris.